here we are again. Not quite the same place actually. This is a different place. This is the Canal de Briar. And I'm heading south. So let's get back to this problem of the science of radiation and health. But let's specifically look at two examples which have been much in the news lately. Let's briefly look at Fukushima and let's also look at Fallujah in Iraq. And let's start with Fallujah. If you want to look on the internet, you will find two scientific papers that were published by my colleagues and I about the effects of weaponry used by the United States-led forces in Fallujah in 2004. You all know that there have been in a lot of stories about increases in cancer and congenital malformations and infant mortality in Iraq after the first Gulf War. And many people have blamed this on uranium, and actually, as it turns out, fairly correctly. But the extraordinary thing is that nobody, no official bodies, and we have the World Health Organization, the United Nations organizations, the United States organizations, millions and billions of dollars of money spent annually on research into cancer and into, into research in this area of the health effects of radiation. And yet nobody has looked into, officially, the, um, the calls for help from Iraq. And in fact, insofar as anybody has done any research, they've researched the Gulf War veterans in America and in the UK, and they've come to the conclusion, without any real uh, foundation, scientific foundation, that there's no case to answer on the basis that uranium could not possibly be the cause of these illnesses that are being discussed. Which is quite silly really, since uranium is known to be radioactive. And radioactivity causes all of the symptoms that have been reported. All the, I mean, radioactivity in cancer, radioactivity in congenital malformation, radioactivity and anything genetic. Radioactivity is a genotoxin. And what do we have in Iraq? We have uranium. Anyway, you will all know that I, uh, my colleagues and I, set up an epidemiological study in Fallujah, and we found that all of the reports were correct. There were huge increases in congenital malformation, huge increases in cancer. I mean, for, for one cancer, for uh, leukemia and, uh, lymphoma and lymphoma, the levels were astonishing, absolutely astonishing, higher even than they had found after Hiroshima. And all of, course, all of this was reported um, in the paper, but also uh, on the TV and, and, in fact, in the media, in the newspaper media. So it's been all over the internet. Still nothing was done. No attempt was made to look for any of the causes or any of the possible causes. So we had to do that. So we scram scratched around and scratched around to get enough money to do this. And of course I have to say that all of this stuff is done with little bits of money that are paid by uh, small organizations, by individuals. We just about managed to get enough money together to measure uranium in the hair of the parents of the children with congenital malformations. And so the second paper, which was published this year, showed that the only possible explanation for these increases in ill health, for these increases in congenital anomalies, for these increases in cancer, was uranium. But not depleted uranium in this case, enriched uranium, slightly enriched uranium. So it raises a lot of questions about what kinds of weapons are being used. I mean, clearly the United States and their allies are no longer using depleted uranium. And in fact, we kind of knew this because I'd also done a study in 2007, 2006, 2007, of radioactivity in a crater um, which was for, uh, produced by a bomb uh, in, in the Lebanese conflict in Lebanon. So the Israelis are using the same weapon. And this weapon generates or uses 
enriched uranium. There's no question about this, no question at all. Two separate laboratories using completely different techniques gave the same answer, enriched uranium. So enriched uranium is associated with this new weapon. Okay, what is it? Well, I don't think we can speculate now, but it could be, could be one of two things, I suppose. And I've mentioned these uh, in various programs and, and, and writings. One, of course, is an entirely new weapon um, which produces enriched uranium. Uh, and this is a sort of tactical new, uh, uh, neutron bomb, small thing. This is a bit far-fetched, but not, not impossible. And the other one, of course, is that the United States and its allies are just getting rid of enriched uranium from, from uh, warheads in order to in decommissioned nuclear warheads in order to just cover their back in terms of uh, analysis. And I have to say, in all of this, it's been extremely difficult to get anyways, anybody to analyze this. And this is, in a sense, the thread of what I want to say, because this brings us to Fukushima. Now, in Fukushima, we, there is no argument about the fact that there is radioactive contamination, huge amounts of it all over the place. In fact, I was sent one sample recently by somebody to analyze, and I sent it to the laboratory. Um, I did some analysis in my own lab, but I sent it to the laboratory in England that I use, which used to be the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority laboratory at Harwell, although it's now made itself uh, independent, supposedly. And they wrote to me and they said, oh, well, you know, we, we're going to report you, or we may report you for, for, for sending material through the mail that is radioactive. Of course, people in Fukushima are living with this stuff. This particular sample came from uh, just outside the flat, from the roof of a, an apartment where a small family were living with a little baby. So much for that. So see, on the one hand, they say that this stuff is dangerous. On the other hand, of course, the people of Japan are being told that it's not dangerous. They're saying in Japan, oh, well, there's no problem. You can live with this stuff. Uh, the dose that you're going to get is very low. You know, it can't possibly cause any health effects, and so forth. So that brings me back, of course, in a full circle to my original point, which I made when I last spoke to you from this boat about a year ago. And this point was that the risk model and the health effects of low, low doses of internal ionizing radiation are the biggest public scandal of human history. And everybody will suffer as a result of this cover-up by the nuclear lobby and by its friends in high places. And in fact, I have to tell you, at the moment, there, are some, there is some evidence that it has very, very powerful friends in high places. One of these, for example, the ex-head of, um, of the International Commission on Radiological Protection. This is the, this is the outfit that, that created this risk model that says everything is safe. This man is now the medical officer of health for Sweden. <laughs> Isn't it astonishing? I mean, it would be it would be a it would be a laughing matter if it weren't so tragic. I don't know quite what one has to do in order to penetrate this sort of glass barrier between the truth, the scientific truth, and now what we see is that the published evidence in scientific papers, in peer review papers, between this barrier and the people who actually make policies in this area. It doesn't seem possible to break through. What does one have to do? How many bodies have to be floating down rivers? How many people have to die before somebody will take a notice? I mean, what we saw in Iraq is that millions have to die and nobody took any notice at all. The World Health Organization, what is the meaning? of the World Health Organization. Can it have any meaning at all if it's not interested in the health of people in the world? And yet the health of people in the world is being completely destroyed and utterly smashed and the, geno the genome of the human race is being torn into little pieces by these releases of radioactivity all the time coming from nuclear power stations and now of course you know, coming from uranium weapons and these uh, accidents like Chernobyl and like uh, Fukushima. And no money is put into research into this at all. The only people that do research into it are people like me, nutcases, living on boats, with no money, with little bits of sums that get paid by individuals from Sweden, from Spain. 
it's a nightmare. Always in French, cauchemar. <laughs> anyway, I'm tired of it all, you know. I'm tired of working and working and working and working on all of this. And not even be, and not really being supported. Running out of money, being attacked, being told that I'm uh, some sort of um, snake oil salesman now because I suggested that people should take calcium tablets in order to try and block access of the uranium to their DNA. I mean, there's now plenty of evidence, plenty of papers in the past where, where this was suggested. And in fact, it was suggested in the, in, the, in the period of weapons fallout for this exact same reason, that because people knew then, bef before all of this skullduggery, or at least maybe in the middle of it, they knew that strontium-90 was dangerous and it shouldn't be allowed near the DNA. So they were developing methods to keep it away from the DNA. Now I seem to have rediscovered this and everybody's attacking me and saying I'm some sort of quack. Well, well, anyway, I tell you what, it's very nice here on my little boat with the sun shining and all of this nice water, peaceful. Peaceful. And I pity all the poor people in Japan and all the poor people in Iraq because they have done nothing to deserve what's happened to them. They're innocent. Well, thank you very much for listening, and I'll talk to you again sometime.